We are in the midst of a, uh, a tour. Uh, Podrig and Johnny McEwen and myself are going around pubs in America doing what's called the Insurrection Tour. And uh, it's through a mix of music and reflection, we're trying to explore the idea that uh, belief in resurrection means nothing if it's not participation in an um, insurrection. That, in a sense, Christianity has become an abstract thing. That something we affirm, as if we can tick all the right answers and that, that makes it all okay. It's something that we, uh, we affirm in creeds and in doctrines. Uh, we go to church every now and again, we might give some money to the poor, but it doesn't necessarily transform us uh, at our very core, in our very essence. Um, there's a story which I like. It's about a group of a Jewish community who are seeking refuge from persecution. And the story goes that they go to Vatican City, and Vatican City opens their doors and invites the community in. But the days turn into weeks, and the weeks turn into months, and finally it looks like it's going to turn into years. So some of the priests go to the Pope and they say, this is all very well looking after our Jewish neighbors, but uh, you know, it's getting, this is getting too much. They've got to find their own place. Now the Pope says, well, it's not very Christian to kind of kick them out. So he says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll debate with the chief rabbi, and if the chief rabbi wins the debate, they can stay. But if I win the debate, then they're going to have to leave. And the priests think this is great, so they go to the Jewish community, and the, the chief rabbi agrees. But there's a language difference, and they don't want to involve interpreters, so they do the traditional uh, uh, method of sign. One person will sign one thing, and the other person will sign a response. So the chief rabbi goes into this massive uh, cathedral, and in the cathedral, the Pope is sitting there in a great throne. And the Pope begins by holding up three fingers like this. And immediately, as if he knew that was going to happen, the rabbi holds up one finger. Now the Pope is a little bit taken aback. He thinks for a second, and then he waves his hand in the air like this. And in response, the rabbi points to the ground. Pope's sweating at the moment, and he gets up finally, and he has an idea. He goes to the altar, and he picks up this great cup, a golden cup encrusted with jewels, with red wine and wafers on this beautiful plate. And he holds the wafers and he holds the wine in front of the rabbi. And the rabbi, as if he knew this was going to happen, reaches around behind him, pulls out a crumpled old brown paper bag, opens it up and pulls out a red apple. And then they part. So the priests get around the, the Pope and they see he's a bit upset. What happened? Pope says, well, I just lost. You know, fair and square. You know, I started off by saying God is three, and my rabbi friend reminded me, ah, God is one. And then I said, ah, God is transcendent. Above us, the whole world is in God's hands. And my rabbi friend, my rabbi friend pointed to the ground, reminding me that God is in our midst, in our neighbor, in the person sitting beside us. And finally, I brought the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Christ, the second Adam. And my rabbi friend reached in and pulled out an apple, reminding me of the first Adam. So when the rabbi returns, the Jewish community all come around and say, what happened? The rabbi goes, I can't believe it. I can't believe the cheek of that guy. So what, what happened? He says, first of all, he tells us we've got three days to leave. He says, what? I said, I'll tell you, you may say that, but not one of us is going. Yeah. Well, okay, well, what happened next? And he says, you know what? He says, I'm going to round you all up. And he said, you can try, but we're staying rooted to the spot. And I'm like, so what happened next? And he goes, that's the most frustrating thing. He says, then we broke for lunch, right? Like, I like that story because, you know, in some respects, that's what people see as a difference between Judaism and Christianity. One is, 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 is rooted in the earth and the other is, is, is caught in abstraction. So theological abstraction, these beliefs, the Jewish communities focused on the earth. That the reality is, how do we bring these two together? The idea that, that our theology, if it isn't lived, if it isn't grounded in reality, in, in, in our day-to-day -day existence, it's nothing, it's just a lie. It's something that makes us feel good about ourselves. See, 
God, and then God becomes what, what Bonhoeffer called the deus ex machina. Deus ex machina is so, a device, something that you bring into a piece of literature or a, or a play that resolves a conflict that can't be resolved by the play itself. Battlestar Galactica did it um, at the end, but kind of got brought God in at the end to kind of fit in some of, its, uh, some of the, the storylines that they couldn't resolve. Um, but uh, the best example is Dallas. Uh, in season six of Dallas, you've got Bobby Ewing, and Bobby Ewing, um, yeah, they kill him off, uh, and, but he's the most popular character. And uh, so they go, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? The viewing figures have dropped. And so what they do is they go, right, at the very end, um, we'll bring him back. And his wife wakes up, goes into the bathroom, and there he is having a shower. And they say the whole of the last season was just a dream sequence. So you know, they wheel God in just because, just, uh, because it, it, it resolves a conflict in the storyline. And Bonhoeffer says, that's what God has become for many of us. God is what we wheel in whenever we're not sure about if life has purpose. We're not sure if, if we're afraid of death. We're afraid of what comes next. And so we wheel God in. Not some sort of reality, just an intellectual thing that we grasp. I mean, at its most fundamental, uh, God is simply what we need to function. When I was very young, my dad told me this story. He said that there was a Baptist minister and every week after his fiery sermon, he would say to the congregation, and you know what? Now I'm going to the neighboring city and I'm going to serve the poor and I'm going to serve the oppressed. And he'd get a round of applause. And he'd say to his family and his friends, right, I'm packing the car and going. I'll be back in five hours. And everybody really respected the guy. Truth is, he had a golf set of golf clubs in the car, right? And he was just going to have a game of golf. He's like, oh, I've got to get rid of the family and friends and the, the congregation for a while. So every week he would do this. Now, we all know God doesn't go to church, right? So God didn't know about this. But eventually, an angel went to God and said, you know what, this Baptist minister, lying to everybody, uh, you know, saying he's serving the poor when he's, he's playing golf. So God goes, no, don't worry about it. I'll, pay, I'll teach the guy a lesson. So the angels are waiting to see what will happen. And God comes down the next week, and after the service, God follows the minister to the golf course. And... As the minister takes his first shot, God just lends a little helping hand, and the ball goes up in the air, bam, straight into the hole, hole in one, perfect shot. The guy's amazed, looking around him, goes to the second hole, does the same thing, ball bounces, teeters, goes into the hole in one. Every single hole, one shot. At the end, God quietly withdraws, and the angels are furious. They say, you know, you were going to teach this guy a lesson. He's been lying to his congregation for years. And instead, you gave him the perfect game of golf. You gave him a golf that Tiger Woods would weep over. This, this, no human being has ever done a feat like this before. What did God say? God said, well, that may be true, but ask yourself this. Who's he going to tell? Yeah, good, isn't it? Um, and that, that, that tells you something about actually what, what it is to be human, that, that what we desire most of all is not success so much as other people's desire. The most precious material in the universe is the desire of the people you desire. That's why when you lose your beloved and a relationship breaks up, you don't just lose one thing that you desire, one person that you desire, as if, you know, I, I, I desire my job, um, I desire, there's certain TV programs I really like, uh, you know, I really like my family, and I really like this, this person, right? And then you lose one of them, and you've still got four or five things you desire, but you've lost one. No, no, no. When you lose your beloved, you don't just lose something you desire, you lose the very ability to desire. The whole world becomes drained of purpose. You no longer desire your job. You no longer like the programs you used to like. Everything is drained of meaning. Because we get our purpose and significance through the gaze of another. That's why you know the story of uh, this guy, um, you know, you know, student from Baylor doing media studies or something, you know, anthropology, I don't know. And he, he the, 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 this ship sinks and he washes up on a desert island, right? And the only other person who's on the desert island is um, some model, some girl who everyone fancies. Lady Gaga. I don't know if anybody fancies her. I don't know. 
Well, she's kind of cool anyway, so we'll, we'll, do, we'll go with Lady Gaga. So honestly, the only two survivors are him and Lady Gaga. And he goes, this is amazing. And so he thinks, this is my chance. And so he kind of he keeps pestering her, you know, for them to kind of have a wee thing together. And she doesn't, no interest, you know, this media student. But eventually, after a few months, she goes, well, it's only the two of us on the island. Like, you know, this is it. This is it. So they have this passionate night together. And the next day, he wakes up, and they're chatting. He says, oh, you know, I'm so glad this finally happened. He says, one thing I'd like you to do, I'd love you, could you just draw a little moustache on your face? Um, wear this cap of mine, and here's some jeans, and here's a shirt of mine. Can you just wear all of that for me and meet me down at the beach? She goes, like, this is a bit weird. Like, you know, I don't know, it's not my style, um, and all of that. And he goes, no, please, just for me. And so she does. She draws a moustache on and the cap and all that. She goes down to the beach, and he sees her. He runs up to her. He gives her a big embrace. He says, oh, it's so good to see you. He says, you'll never guess who I just slept with, right? In other words... <laughs> It wasn't enough to be with Lady Gaga. He needed to tell somebody about it, you know? He needed to tell somebody. So, God becomes... Oh, my goodness, we're going to be... Just, oh, oh, we need, need to stop. Um, God becomes the ultimate um, kind of uh, thing that justifies our actions because we can't face the fact that maybe we're going to die, maybe life is meaningless, maybe everything you've ever done is pointless, everyone you've ever loved is going, is going to nothingness, the universe, nobody's watching. We don't like that, so we kind of say, oh, there's God. God kind of grounds it all. That's not the Christian God. That's a lie. God is lived. That's the whole thing about Christianity. If it's not incarnated, it's a lie. You can say, I believe in the resurrection. I believe in God. I believe um, in the Holy Spirit. If we are not the site where God manifests in the world, it's just a lie. It's something we tell ourselves to feel good about ourselves. Doubt is part of faith. Christianity has a religion where God doubts God. Only religion where God says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Doubt is central to our faith. Doubt doesn't take away from it. Doubt tests whether our faith is real or just a fantasy. Now, how does it work? I'll finish with this. <laughs> um, is that, uh, take marriage as an example. I travel around America, and you guys get married very young. And, and quite often, not all of you, uh, but some, quite often, someone will say this to me, oh, I've found the person I'm supposed to marry. You know, this is the person I'm going to marry. You know, this, this is written in the stars. This is what God wants. So absolutely, there's nobody else for me. That's fine. Anybody who's a bit older, most of us know that the reality is that's probably not the truth. Like, things can go wrong. Relationships can break down. It's not that easy. It's not like you pass the finishing line and it's all going to be rosy. It's, relationships are very difficult. The other thing is, see, if you don't experience the true horror of marriage, the true horror of, of proposing to somebody, you're not a true romantic. It's terrible. It's the most awful thing you could ever do. Um, think about it one way. You're saying to someone, um, I'm going to impose myself on you for the rest of your life. <laughs> how, can, how dare you do that? You know what you're like, and you're going to impose yourself on another person for the rest of their life. That's terrible. You should be ashamed of yourselves. It's, awful. it's, all, it's really it's awful. Um, or look at it the other side. You're going to ask them to impose themselves on you for the rest of your life and all of their annoying habits and all of their idiosyncrasies when you could be out having a good time. It's terrible. Marriage, all, all the things that could go wrong. All the things. What, and and what, what's that? Is that bad to acknowledge that? No, because you see, if you go, I don't know if I love you. I don't know if you love me. I don't know what love is. You know what? This is probably going to go wrong. But you know what? I can't help myself. Will you marry me? I can't do anything but ask. Does that take away from the marriage process? Does that, does that make it weak? Or does that really fulfill it? You know, we're all running around trying to find the most romantic ways to propose. You know, I'll fireworks, I'll ride, I'll power plane, I'll parachute out, I'll do whatever, you know. Um, and you know why we're obsessed about trying to find the most romantic way to propose? Because we've lost the true romance. The true romance is whenever you go, this is horrific, this is awful, I don't even like you. <laughs> but, you know. But please, please, marry me. Um, and then you know that it's not some fake thing. If, if, if the doubt comes in, you go, right, I'm just going to clear off then. Then it's not real. If the doubt 
in the, when, when you've had the doubt, if you're still in your gut, in your, if you bleed that person, then you know it's real. It's not some sort of fantasy that you have to tell yourself. So here it is. Now, last year I was in America and somebody asked me at the end of this talk, this debate, they said, well, it's theology, it's all very well, but um, I, get the, I get the feeling that you don't take Christian theology that seriously. And he says, you know what, I want to ask you a question. Do you affirm or do you deny the resurrection of Christ? And for me, it was the perfect opportunity to come clean as a, as a Christian speaker, to basically be able to say, yeah, you've, you've, you've found me out, you've called me out. I do deny the resurrection of Christ. Of course I do. I, you know, I'm not going to make a secret of it. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to hide that. I'm not going to try and paint a nice picture of it. You're asking me straight, and I'll say it straight, and anybody can see it if they go on the internet. I'll do, I do. You know, every time I walk past someone who's suffering, every time I don't stand up for those who are forced to live on their knees, every time I don't cry for those people who have no tears to shed, don't speak out for those who have had their tongues torn out. Yeah, I deny the resurrection. And sometimes I affirm it. Sometimes I affirm it. Whenever I do stand up for those who are suffering, when I do look after the persecuted and the oppressed. It doesn't matter what I say, or I believe in the resurrection. I deny it when I am not the place where resurrection takes place. I deny it when life does not emanate from me, when life is not found within me, when I do not bring life to those around me. In the same way as a philosophy lecture, people say, do you believe in God? And I'm like, hey, let's talk about that at the pub. That's a great question. That's br oh, you're asking me as a Christian? Oh, no, 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 I don't believe in God. No, no, no. No, because to say I believe in God means I live a life of love. I'm committed to those people who are around me, who are suffering. Most of the time, no, I don't believe. Oh, intellectually, do I believe there's some sort of supreme being? Yeah. Do, oh, do I believe in God? Do I live it? Is it in my flesh and blood? Most of the time, no. Um, I'm going to read you a poem that was written for... Um, some people in Uganda, I'm not sure if you're aware, in Uganda at the moment there's a small effort to legalize a certain kind of human cleansing which involves either death penalty or life imprisonment for certain people over a theological debate. This is not a liberal agenda. Think about the people in the prison in Uganda. These are bodies like yours, mine, Close your eyes. Please, close them. Do not open them until you've breathed a little deeper. Put the fingers of your one hand to the wrist of the other and keep your pulse a moment. Are you calm? Are you content with holding your own skin in your own safe and holy skin? Think about the people sleeping in the prison in Uganda. This is not a liberal agenda. These are people, not quite corpses, yet. And it's not about forgetting all your morals with some rationalist adjust adjustment or some sad subjective judgment. The Samaritan did not sin, yet still was hated Berated, judged, and deemed a lesser kind of human. Think about the people in the prison in Uganda. This is not some liberal agenda. The title of that poem, which I didn't give you at the start because I wondered whether it distract you from listening to it, is Intercession for Lesbian and Gay Ugandans. I'd like to invite you to stand for our final benediction. I'm Catholic, and the Mass ends with, um, the Mass has ended, go in peace. Some of you might be familiar with that. Uh, here's my version. The task is ended. Go in pieces. Our faith has been rear-ended, certainty amended, and something might be mended that we didn't know was torn. 
and we are fire, bright, burning fire, turning from the higher places from where we fell, emptying ourselves into the hell in which we'll find our loving and beloved brother, mother, father, sister, friend. So the task is ended. Go in pieces to love and love your world. <laughs>